the day I started, uh, I literally had one .NET developer for the entire bureau. And since then, we've hired many people, but I just wanted to illustrate that uh, in government, sometimes there are many challenges, and one is certainly resources, right? So, um, you know, we look across the landscape of the resources we have at the Bureau of Technology. The majority right now, and it's changing, but the majority right now are, are uh, mainframe COBOL programmers, right? So we support the mainframe as a platform. We support DS400. Uh, we support, obviously, Windows and, 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 and SaaS solutions. Uh, but part of the challenge is getting our infrastructure right, getting our platforms modernized. And so when we talk about you know, big data and, and opportunities there, it's really challenging for us because if I want to export uh, records out of a uh, you know over 30 year old property system I have to go grab one of my COBOL programmers and sit down and and think through it for a week or two uh, before we start coding right um, so part of what Commissioner still touched upon are some really really pivotal pivotal projects and initiatives that we recently passed the county board and I'll touch on them um, because he helped certainly pass them as well as our CIO President Preckwinkle our Deputy CL, Mary Jo Horace, and others, uh, but we're actually the folks that are gonna work with the agencies to implement them, right? So when you look at property, we were able to get the assessor, the treasurer, the clerk, the uh, board of review, and the recorder of deeds to all work together with the Bureau of Technology to agree on one comprehensive solution to address property. And that's, that's massive, because what that has done is it's given us the opportunity to migrate you know, probably over 700 million records to a more modern platform, and when it's time for us to actually export data out of it, it's there, it's easy. Uh, we have workforce that can actually, you know, be very agile, very nimble, and actually exporting data out and supporting some of the other initiatives, as well as open data, uh, which dovetails quite nicely with, with, with big data. So um, that's one example. Uh, another example will be ERP, I won't touch up on that too long, but I think you guys all kind of get the gist. The county has multiple ERP systems. I think it's about eight or nine across the hospitals, force reserves, the treasurer, internally at the Bureau of Technology. We are consolidating to one product, one platform, and it's truly amazing. And you know, talk about analytics. I mean, we're gonna be able to mine data that touches, like Commissioner Steele said, every one of us, uh, soup the nuts. So that's a huge initiative. Another initiative um, that's, that's really big is integrated revenue. So right now we have systems, and I'll uh, admit it, you know, Microsoft Access is still around, uh, PowerPoint's still around, uh, .NET, PHP, uh, mainframe systems, and we're actually going to be able to take all of that and in a few years push it off a cliff, and actually we're going to work from one centralized solution. And that's, that's really massive. And so for me, from a government perspective, it's really tough to deliver on some of these really you know, more visionary initiatives when we sort of don't have the core where we need it to be. And a lot of these applications, based on President Preckwinkle's leadership, we sat down many years ago and we completely planned our roadmap and, and, and it's coming to fruition now. Another one that's really uh, near and dear to many of our hearts is integrated, what we call integrated criminal justice. And what, what we're doing is we're actually implementing an enterprise service bus. And so we have the sheriff, we have the state's attorney, we have the chief judge. Uh, Ty Miller's in a room from chief judge. Uh, we have you know public defender, all these justice agencies that have disparate systems. You know, it could, you know Windows based, mainframe based. You know, you, you name it, every single flavor. But we really didn't have a means uh, to actually communicate that data. We had some exchanges in place, but. They were legacy uh, applications, and it just wasn't efficient. And to, to paint a picture uh, of why this matters so much, for instance, for the sheriff, in order to transport prisoners, we literally print pieces of paper, uh, and you know, after they leave the court, you know, they attach it to their physical body, right? Pieces of paper today, every day. Um, you know, we move over 1,500 or so prisoners around. So. Um, this is a real life problem, and that's just one example. Uh, another example would be, you know, in certain places, uh, you know, working with the sheriff, there are stacks and stacks of paper and cubby holes, and, and when they move prisoners, they have to literally account for every piece of paper 
to, and actually balance that out, obviously, with the prisoners to make sure we did not release someone that should be released or we were not holding someone that, that still should be in the system. So the sheriff is doing a lot of great stuff to implement new uh, enterprise systems in their shop to address these issues. We're partnering with them so that our agencies can share data across the enterprise. And, and then what gets me even more excited is we're not going to stop there. Every single enterprise system that we implement, ESB is considered, as well as open data and big data, but you know we've got some work to do. So what I mean by that is we have a program the president initiated, uh, I want to say over four years ago, maybe five years ago, and it's called STAR. It's Set Targets and Achieve Results. So we have a performance management office at the county, uh, the first ever when President Preckwinkle was elected, she appointed. And actually, for you know, over the last four years of my time, we actually set targets and objectives, and we, we track them. Um, and, and people may go, oh, no business does that. Private does that. It's what we do. That's how we kind of determine whether we're successful or not, whether we're meeting our goals. And for government, that's not always true. And so for, for Cook County, it wasn't exactly true from a sort of a, a very large collaborative space. Now it is. So we're actually backing that up with BI, and we're actually going to use ESB to actually mine data from all these systems that we're implementing to support that effort. We have established a data warehouse, and that's gonna continue to grow and blossom so that one day, over the next few years or so, we're going to be able to actually sit down and, and share a lot more with the public. We're gonna be able to share more data uh, to help programs and initiatives. And I can certainly share more, but I, I think I've taken enough time so far. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. You laid out the landscape with uh, some exciting stories and opportunities for applications of big data in government. And we'd like to actually move in now to some specific uh, beneficial applications of big data. And let me just start with Amish, which is uh, sitting right next to Derek. About big data is not about technology, right? It all starts with the organization's mission and what outcomes you want to drive uh, to optimize your mission's effectiveness. And um, you don't start as a big bank approach, as Dr. Rao mentioned earlier. Uh, you've got to start with an incremental uh, and uh, you know, evolving journey, right? Iterative journey. So in cases that we work with uh, customers, both in the defense intelligence space as well as the civilian government, uh, state and local level as well, is it was always about an outcome. So for example, we were working with the Portland Police Bureau, and one of their uh, main goal for the mission was to reduce recidivism of uh, domestic violence perpetrators. So what they were challenged with is hundreds of cases they had to deal with every year. And not only that, the complexity of relying upon professionals' uh, judgment of whether somebody is a serious uh, perpetrator or not, and you know what kind of intervention is required to um, to avoid uh, the the you know the the, uh, the victims uh, from being uh, uh, you know uh, hurt again, right? So the biggest challenge there was to re uh, find those attributes that allows them to figure out who are the most high risk recidiv uh, recidivist offenders and then target them for further action and so make sure that the victims are not you know, uh, uh, you know, at jeopardy. At the same time, it does not uh, create a liability for the police uh, agency as well. And by using uh, prescriptive analytics, uh, which was based on what the predictions were, they were able to figure out which specific high-risk offenders that they need to target and put behind bars. By doing so, they were uh, able to reduce the uh, number of uh, offenses also, at the same time, they were able to increase the number of cases that they were able to deal with and close effectively those cases at a short period of time. So that's one example. The other one is the city of Minneapolis. Um, they were sharing data between different uh, you know, city departments, so the road, police, planning department, etc. all these different agencies collecting and sharing data about planned roadworks, planned events, etc. And they were trying to figure out the correlation between where the crime happens, depending on the traffic conditions, depending on the road works, depending on the events, etc. And by doing so, they were able to reduce the crime. They were able to increase the uh, operational efficiency of all the road works, but also uh, the traffic systems, etc. So there are lots of these kind of use cases that we've actually seen. For example, in um, uh, Florida, the Department of Juvenile Justice, 
one of the things that they were trying to do is to uh, reduce the number of uh, juveniles in the prison, but at the same time make sure that when they are released on probation, that they are transformed, their lives are transformed to become you know, you know, a, a productive citizen. So what we did was we did longitudinal analysis on what kind of intervention programs worked most effectively on which kind of uh, juvenile offenders. And by doing so, we got be, being able to come up with the right uh, type of intervention plan for the juvenile so that they can be uh, transformed into better uh, uh, you know, children, right? Um, so there are a number of these kind of uh, you know, uh, capabilities we've seen being used by government agencies. Uh, one of the most common things I think we started to see, which Dr. Rao we did earlier, is it's not just about pres prescriptive analytics, but it's also about the, what is the next best action. We call it cognitive analytics. And cognitive analytics is all about knowing which exact um, you know, uh, action is going to work the best based on uh, evidence-based hypothesis, right? So there's a lot of evidentiary uh, uh, data points that you collect, you analyze, and you come up with the hypothesis, and then you rank the hypothesis in a meaningful way to understand which kind of uh, next best action could you actually uh, embark on to drive the uh, outcome for the mission. So here's just some examples. Thank you very much, Amish. Uh, it's interesting because sometimes we think about one-to-one uh, -one personalization in the B2C or the consumer arena, and here you've talked about government applications, uh, bringing it down to specific people and institutions, which is very good. Okay. Bob, would you like to uh, and carry on? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thanks. Uh, I live in Elgin, and it's good to be close to home for a change. So. <laughs> but. Uh, let me, let me uh, give you one that is close to home. Um, how many of you remember the NATO summit here in Chicago? Yeah. What was the biggest concern going into that? Security. Security, right. And um, pretty clearly, it was about how to secure the city, deployment of the police, et cetera. So I'm going to share with you a story that we got the OK to share with a big audience at Open World a few years ago. But essentially, um, we were called in about six weeks before the summit. And uh, why might a data warehouse have been a bad solution to propose getting called in six weeks before the NATO summit? Takes a while to build one of those, right? The other thing that um, the police rightly identified um, is that there was an opportunity to leverage social media in terms of determining where to deploy the right forces at, at various times. And so very quickly, we were able to create a data repository it was using a predecessor tool called Indeca of ours before we had a Hadoop-based solution, but pulled together the data, analyzed it, looked at what was going on without building out schema and all the rest of that, and figured out where was the right place to put people. That is a common use case we're seeing today, not only in police, but in other agencies as well. And now we're starting to see that being tied to such things as predictive analytics, predicting what's gonna happen in the future, to your point, and also um, such things as image recognition as well, uh, when we get into the three-letter agencies and such. Um, but what I would also tell you is there's a lot of other use cases here around predictive, uh, we worked with the state of Pennsylvania, for example, in terms of determining um, which welfare cases to investigate from a statewide standpoint. Um, there's also um, other potential applications in terms of uh, tax returns, where predictive analytics has been used in the past to determine where to audit and such. And what really drives these types of projects is the availability of other data sources that couldn't be analyzed in the past. Things like social media. Yeah, I wonder why that guy's taking European vacations and has that income level. Um, things like um, sensor data from the standpoint of managing um, cargo, logistics, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of new and emerging use cases here. A lot of this is quite complex but the tools are moving ahead pretty quickly and we believe that you're going to see more and more applications in this space as well over time 
uh, such as in healthcare information exchanges and such, where we work with uh, the state of Minnesota. So lots of interesting opportunities here. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Stephen, if you want to offer a use case, appreciate that. Yeah, it, it kind of goes back to one we've used with our relational technology to be able to you know, look for things such as uh, aliases, aliases of arrested people and things like that by changing part of their names, their address, different information, and utilizing probabilistic matching, you can kind of tie that together and then realize that stuff is going on and bringing multiple records and information together. Where that really is going to come to play with which was brought up here a lot is you've got Internet of Things, you've got PDF files, Word docs, structured, unstructured data, all these different file types, and nobody's really you know, said, how do we correlate it? How do we bring it together? But there are tool sets like Tika and other types of technologies that we utilize to be able to get a PDF into a readable format, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, HTML, Twitter feeds, and be able to utilize that information to match up against legacy and other types of data that you have coming back from your older systems, all those correlations can be found and be more meaningful, um, both for predictive analytics and other areas like that, and just to get a better idea and sense of which data should be used together when you're going to be building your reporting. Thank you, Stephen. Maybe now we could address a different uh, viewpoint, and that being the building of the platform that will support these predictive, prescriptive, analytic applications. We might look at some of the topics uh, panelists can weigh in related to provisioning of cloud services, uh, public, private cloud, security aspects related to that. Uh, maybe we could start off. Uh, yeah, so um, let me provide a couple of comments. That was pretty wide ranging. Um, so, predictive analytics, um, we're seeing more and more often that starting to move out of the data warehouse. We believe that the data warehouse still has a use case going forward for being the source of high quality data for reporting for ad hoc query kinds of things where you have to have exact reports. But from the standpoint of doing predictive analytics, more data is often better. And from that standpoint, we do see not only the users, but also the vendors moving in that direction. Um, the younger statisticians have a tendency to graduate from the universities knowing R these days. Um, so they want to do the open source stuff. When we come into an audience and it's the older folks, it's the SaaS guys usually that want to, to deploy that. And SaaS has moved toward to do as their solution going forward for the most advanced predictive analytics. So um, pretty clearly different use cases for the data warehouse and, and for the clusters themselves in terms of how they're being used and, and why they're being deployed that way. Okay, I'm just wondering if we could continue on, but uh, any thoughts on doing big data analysis in your local data center versus a cloud service uh, provider and what the implications related to security might be? So a lot of times I know for us, you know, we, we take a look at the cost, the cost, you know, value and return on investment. So uh, typically, you know, it, it's on a case by case basis, really, uh, you know, not once always fits all. So, uh, so uh, right now we're working on a number of uh, applications with uh, several groups in the county, uh, and uh, we do have some flavors that will be hosted in the cloud. Uh, the data warehouse that we're building, particularly for our STAR program, I talked about earlier, uh, is actually on-prem. Uh, and so, um, you know, for government, it's a lot easier sometimes when you can take a look at COT solutions, uh, and, you know, instead of lots of custom development, uh, you know, we really just don't have the luxury of the time. Uh, we really need to put in things that are mature uh, they're a lot easier to support in most cases, and you know the cost is usually pretty, you know, pretty standardized by that point. 
Uh, so um, for us, again, it's on a case by case basis. Um, we think the cloud can be secure. Um, we think we can do it better <laughs> than, than a lot of the customers that we work with, actually. Um, now that said, um, we do see that organizations, when they think about the cloud, need to think about where their data is going to live long term and whether they're going to be moving data into and out of the cloud and what the data volumes are going to be. Because the hidden cost in all of this, regardless of what cloud provider you use, are the network costs. So if you're starting to move terabytes back and forth on a regular basis, um, you're not only going to have performance challenges, but you're going to have network costs to deal with. And so when you start to investigate that environment, you've got to start to think about where ultimately you want to do the analysis going forward. So I'll make one uh, more point. Um, w w when you look at cloud, I, I know it can be secured, but a lot of times elected officials have issues with control uh, because you know people can go directly to the vendor and actually that's you know been, been litigated in Cook County certainly over the years. Uh, so that's for government. That's a challenge. Uh, I'm pretty loud. I don't even really need a mic. Uh, but uh, that's something to be concerned with. So it's not always whether it's just a matter of technical security. Uh, that is also a component in terms of control. Yes. There are some legal ramifications too, as far as where government data is housed. Uh, will dictate if the cloud is a viable solution, especially with quick data. So. Sure. Um, let me throw another challenge <clears throat> around whether or not you can use the cloud. And I think cloud is really um, So I used, to, I used to be the CIO of uh, Healthcare and Family Services downstate. <clears throat> One of the problems that you have um, that you don't have in the cloud center is when you own all the data, you have to pay for all the labor, and um, the technology is changing extremely rapidly. As a result, in order to get the labor you need to really support this technology, you've got to really pay some fairly big bucks. In my experience, the state of Illinois clearly can't. I doubt that Cook County can. And so this is one of the issues. And I think thinking about, and I understand the issue of control, which I think is a 20th century issue. Um, the reality is cloud centers can pay the most money for the highest quality of labor, which you want if you want your data to be high quality. If you want to control your data and have it low quality, that's what people have been opting for. I think it's a bad solution. And I think, and I think this is one of the issues we're dealing with. The amount of data that we're gathering is going up exponentially every year. Can you really think that government, even most private corporations, I don't think can keep up with this. We, we need to start looking at the Googles, the, you know, the Facebooks and the others that are really handling massive amounts of data for models. And I don't think owning things is, is gonna work out in the long run. And I, and I think it, it, it's a big challenge and it's a big political challenge, I think, as you point out, that's the major problem. But if you don't get over the politics, you're gonna have some kind of crisis that you don't wanna face, I think. So, so let me just describe what's going on in the commercial world because um, a lot of folks see that as a challenge and a lot of them have determined that they're going to go into the data aggr the aggregator business themselves and sell subscriptions to data and make money from their IT centers to help pay for all that. Um, not only do they see that as an opportunity, they see it as a necessity because there are folks, for example, that make thermostats that are worried about Google and Nest and owning all the data. Uh, there are folks who uh, provide auto insurance that are worried about the automakers going into the auto insurance business. I always tell people that in that world, the ones with the most data are going to win in the future. And um, that's really what's motivating people in that space today. Also another emerging trend, which is on-premise cloud. Um, a lot of government agencies in Europe have started to shift to on-premise cloud as well. So you get the best of both worlds, you know, the cloud as well as you have the control of your data. You know. I'm just wondering from the perspective of the, uh, the vendor representatives who are looking at their clients and Derek, 
what do you see in terms of um, say the percentage of applications that are being done by vendor specific uh, versus open source uh, tools because I think many of the individuals here are thinking about well should we be going with our Python using a cloud provider you know whether it's Amazon Web Services Microsoft or should we have a tool on site there's cost implications training implications just wondering what your lay of the land is what you see out there I can reflect upon customers viewpoint not IPM's viewpoint uh, customers that I've dealt with tell us the following things one is what is, what is the maturity of analytics first of all where are they in their journey of analytics adaption across the enterprise the second part is about uh, the types of use cases and applications that they're building uh, so depends on what their maturity curve uh, position is but also the cost benefits of it as well so just having a pilot or a proof of concept it's fine to go with uh, open source technologies it's fine to go with cloud deployment etc but they, the more mature they get in their requirements the more complex it gets their reliance on open source goes down as well um, so some of the intelligence agencies that we work with primarily uh, have weighed on the pros and cons of open source versus the proprietary technology and one of the argument that they worked out was that uh, it's good to have open source technology uh, the downside of it is that the support on the patches, you know, how many patches get fixed, how fast, how the number of patches, et cetera, security, security, et cetera, becomes questionable. Which is why then they switch off from open source to uh, uh, you know, provide technology for these, you know, uh, based on mission that they have. I would definitely agree with everything that you just said. And uh, let's be honest, in government, you know, uh, we always want to contract and one throat the choke. Uh, it just makes life a little simpler. Uh, so a perfect example would be, you know, we look at content management, uh, enterprise content management, you know, you know, there are plenty of products out there, but we went proprietary. But when we looked at CMS in terms of content management for our web solutions, well, you know, we use Drupal, right? So, um, you know, on certain projects, there are tools that we use that are part of the open source stack, uh, certainly, uh, a number of things I could rattle off, but when it comes to enterprise systems, uh, maintenance, support, long-term uh, strategy uh, implementations, then you know it's just going to be proprietary uh, nine times out of ten. What I'll add to that, um, this is sound weird coming from an Oracle guy, is that um, open source is going to get more and more popular because it's what the kids are learning. So if you want to hire people with skills going forward, it's going to get harder and harder to find people with proprietary skills and easier to find people with open source skills. So that's the challenge. And I'll just add on, uh, just at IIT in our marketing analytics program, we're doing uh, R, which many universities are, and we're also in our masters in uh, finance adopting Python. So now we don't know if we should just have a single language or two languages, but that is true, that the, the, the students are looking for it, and now more of our uh, recruiters are looking for it, yes. Uh, I'm just wondering from the standpoint of uh, deploying these analytic applications and having some degree of coordination, have you seen in clients or your own organizations uh, any use of a center for excellence of analytics as a way to try and standardize applications rather than having, as we talk about, uh, a whole variety of uh, data, what about a whole variety of tools? Uh, is there any attempt to try and get some coordination uh, through maybe a center for uh, excellence? So we, we, we you know, we, we don't call it a center of excellence, but that's pretty much how it's operating. Um, you know, a perfect example would be every single procurement that the Bureau of Technology is leading uh, down at the RFP level, I mean, drafting, we have uh, our performance management team at the table. Uh, we're looking at, you know, metrics and we're looking at goals and all those things good government we're supposed to. Uh, and then once we award, they're back at the table. Uh, we're discussing, you know, implementation and um, we're setting targets and all those things. So um, it's happening. Uh, it's been happening for many years now. Uh, but we're still uh, maturing. Um, you know, it's, it's still a, a curve there that we're, we're working to 
uh, to resolve a number of things uh, in terms of how we deliver technology, uh, in terms of um, getting the elected officials to participate. Uh, it can be somewhat challenging if you if you are from Chicago, you may you may know this. Uh, but um, President Preckwinkle is, I think, has done a really good job of trying to collaborate with everyone. Uh, so the short answer for me from government, it, the answer is yes. And so we think about it not only you know at the end of the solution, but at the beginning. And actually, uh, it's required in order for us to justify projects in many cases. So I can add up on some federal agencies have started uh, forming uh, COEs now for a variety of different reasons. One being standardizations of uh, standardization of tools and technologies, but also um, training, uh, you know, skills development as well. Um, data scientists are in shortage, will continue to be the case for another few years. Um, so they're looking at ways of uh, having fast fail ideas coming up in COEs as well, as to how you come up with your ways of analyzing data, your types of data that can be analyzed, etc. So there's a variety of different reasons why, why COEs are becoming more popular. And I'll just add something that was said earlier. Um, don't do a big data project for the sake of doing a big data project. Um, the business has to drive it. They have to drive the requirements, hopefully the funding as well, the funding requests. Um, Gardner says that we're at the trough of disillusionment with big data. And the reason that in early, a lot, the reason is a lot of the early projects were built by IT organizations for the purpose of resume building, not for solving real business problems. So that's what you have to watch out for. Any additional questions from the participants here for the panelists? Okay, well I know that we in uh, the concluding remarks are standing in the way of going to lunch, so we'll, <laughs> probably wrap this up if I could just take uh, 30 or 45 seconds of my professorial uh, position, if you will. One thing that I haven't heard today, and indeed we should be focusing on getting the data ready, also selecting the appropriate analytic software to derive the results, but how do we communicate effectively these actionable insights to our constituent agencies that we need to have some effective communication through visual analytics, through storytelling, whatever it may be. I know this is on the soft sides rather than the quantitative methods, but unless you can effectively communicate your results to your stakeholders in your agencies, you're not gonna get the win-win that you're looking for in the continuing support. Um, so I think at this point, I'd like to just uh, ask for a, a warm uh, set of recognition for our panelists. levels and um, we are starting a little bit late so I feel at loss that we didn't get to hear a little bit more so we will we plan a lot of webinars out of it to, for the deep dive and uh, Kevin will talk a little bit more about it and with that I want to thank you all for taking the time sharing the knowledge and willing to participate further on so thank you thank you all Thank you. Round of applause, folks. Um, Commissioner Steele, to... What? <laughs> I pray over everybody. Just stand still. I pray over everybody real quick. Just to... Yeah. Do the words with us? Yes. Okay. Thank you.